Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now we're glad to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We appreciate your presence. You're always welcome in the house of God and appreciate you being here. We welcome any visitor that might be visiting with us today. May the Lord bless you. To you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the next hour we can be a real inspiration to many of you. And if you get on your phone and call a friend and have them to tune in and get the Northside Baptist Church Hour, we'll try to be a blessing to them. And so I hope that many of you that's disabled to be in God's house today will be blessed by the hour coming up and by you calling a friend and letting them know about it You'll be doing them a favor and us as well. So we appreciate it very much. And now at this time, we'll turn the service over to Paul, our music director. And I'm sure what he has lined up for us will be a blessing to our hearts. So Paul, at this time. Get your hymn on and turn to page 201. and help the choir out as they sing Joy to the World, page 408.
choir's final song this morning will be one entitled Heart the Herald Angels Sing. Amen. Take your Bibles, will you please, and turn to Matthew chapter 1 for the reading of God's Word today. Now what I've been telling you from time to time was demonstrated last week in Atlanta. Whenever they tried that demon-possessed man for raping and murdering that fine Christian woman, and the terrible damage he did to her and the terrible torment he performed, and the sentence they gave him, gave him, he'll be eligible for parole in seven years. Has ever been a case where a man should have been put to death? That is one of them. So I've told you time and time again, our judicial system is corrupt, it's rotten, it stinks to high heaven, and that proves it without a shadow of a doubt. That man should have been put to death, already been put to death. But now, he may be free after seven years, you may say, now, Preach Edwards, didn't they say they had see to it? He didn't walk the streets of Atlanta anymore. Well, the same system that will permit him to, be, to apply for parole after seven years will let the man loose. The same system. Don't you believe a word of it? That man may be free again one day to murder and rape and harm other innocent people. They had a Judas on the jury. 
And he knew, evidently, he knew, that is, my opinion is, he knew when he was put on the jury that he would not sentence his friend to the electric chair. He knew that. He's going to hold out. And when 11 intelligent people knew without a shadow of a doubt that the man should be put to death without any doubt, they knew that this one betrayer, this Judas, held out and they had to go along with his idea that just let the man be sentenced to life in prison. That's pitiful. That's a shame. That's a disgrace. That shows you how rotten and how our criminal judicial system stinks to high heaven. And that is an example of what I've been telling you from time to time. And you need to speak out against it. And maybe someday, I hope someday, before too many innocent people have to die, by these criminals on the streets and in their homes in various places that we will get some politicians and judges and lawyers and men in authority that can and will do something about this uh, uh, system we have today called the criminal justice system. It's pathetic, it's a shame, it's a disgrace to the state of Georgia and even this nation. You know I'm telling you the truth. Not only that, but I was greatly disturbed when the governor sold out to the RA movement and had written a letter to the politicians to be voting on whether or not to ratify the RA movement uh, in uh, the first of the year and trying to persuade them to ratify this movement. He has sold out to that crowd. Beloved, I'm greatly disturbed about that. Now, I'm not much of a hand to write letters to politicians. Some of you are. You can do that. And I should do it more often, I'm sure. But some of you ought to write to the government about this and write to our politicians that's going to be voting on this matter the first of the year. This ERA movement should not be ratified. It's contrary to the word of God. Somebody said ERA means Eve rule Adam. If you read Genesis 3.16, you'll find there the Bible says Adam is to rule Eve. So they want to reverse the thing and let Eve rule Adam. And I'm shocked at the governor uh, setting out to that crowd and doing what he's doing. Now Jimmy Carter and his wife tried that. You see where they are. They tried to high pressure uh, uh, putting that thing over in this nation. And you see where they are today. And if this man decides to run again for some office in the future, I'm sure that the Bible-believing Christians in this land and the law-abiding citizens that know really right from wrong about this matter and understand it will remember that if he tries to run for office again. He ought to have been talking about this back when he ran for governor. He should have been making mention of this before he found out he could not succeed himself. But no, he waits right to time for him to leave the governor's office and then he sails out to that crowd and now he's writing letters trying to twist the arms of those who will be voting for the ERA wanting them to vote for it. I, I'll tell you I'm shocked. I didn't, I didn't think the governor would do a thing like that. I'm, I'm greatly surprised and uh, greatly disappointed in that man. I thought he was one of the best governors we ever had until he did this and now I don't have any confidence in him and you're welcome. If you don't like it you can leap it, leave it, lump it or whatever you want to. That's my conviction about it. Now that's not my message. I want you to turn, will you please, to Matthew chapter 1. And we begin reading with verse 18 in Matthew chapter 1. I want to talk to you today about the most unusual birth ever taken place on this earth. I saw on the news the other day a stupid birth taking place. A man and his wife in a bathtub and his wife giving birth to a child under the water. And the little thing remained under the water for about 12 or 13 minutes, I believe. And they're talking about it and bragging about now giving birth to children under the water. And so people, you know, uh, they want to do anything to get their names in the paper and make the headlines. And little innocent children being born under water and maybe remaining there for several minutes. One of these days, somebody want to drown one of those little fellows. And they'll find out then what a terrible mistake they've made. That, that's... That's, that's stupidity. That, that's wrong. That's not, absolutely not right. God didn't tell us in the Bible when you give birth to a child, let it be done on, in a bathtub under water or in a river. He didn't tell us that. We know how children are supposed to be born, and that's downright wrong. 
to birth little children that can't help themselves underwater in a bathtub. Now that's that's the kind of birth we see today. Don't be surprised at anything you see happening today anymore. Don't be a bit surprised. There are going to be some things happening today that's absolutely shocking and disturbing in the future that you haven't dreamed about. And they're coming. You might as well get set for them. And so in Matthew chapter 1 verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph. Before they came together she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. And while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken to the Lord by the prophet saying Behold a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which been interpreted as God with us. Then Joseph being raised from sleep did his angel of the Lord had bidden him and he took unto him his wife and knew her not till she had brought forth a firstborn son and called his name Jesus. Mary was just as much a virgin after the birth of Jesus as she was before. Now we're going to speak to you today about the most unusual birth ever taken place. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 you have the first promise of the coming Savior. And then you find time moving on and finally God decided he was going to narrow down the, the lineage or the bloodline of the coming of the Messiah upon the earth that people might look for him and know that he would be coming upon the earth. In John chapter 3 and verse 16 the Bible said for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now Jesus Christ was God's only begotten son. Now you have adopted sons, you have son-in-laws, you have legal sons, but Jesus Christ was God's only begotten son that's what the Bible tells you and so God begins to narrow the bloodline down to certain groups and certain individuals and he starts out with Abraham he tells Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 that the Messiah would come through his descendants through him should all the nations of the earth be blessed all people and Sarah died he married another woman and she gave birth to six sons so we find Abraham now has more than one son, but wait, God is going to narrow it down again. And God said, through Isaac shall thy seed be. So God tells us then that the virgin birth of the Son of God would come through Isaac. And then we find that Isaac has uh, two sons. There we have uh, Isaac uh, having Esau and Jacob being born into his family. And so Esau and Jacob now, the twin sons of Isaac being born, then God must narrow the line down again, and he does. And God said, through Jacob shall the Messiah come to the earth. And so then we find that Jacob kind of messed things up because he had 12 sons. God said, all right, I will step in and narrow the line down again. And God stepped in and said that one of Jacob's sons by the name of Judah, through him would come the Messiah. And so he narrowed the line down to Judah. But in Genesis chapter 38, we find something taking place there. That's placed in the word of God because God doesn't leave things like this out. It's not a beautiful picture. But it's in the word of God anyway. We find that uh, Judah uh, had a son that died. Uh, uh, that uh, he, he, uh, His wife died. Rather, he died and his wife was left a widow. And we find that Judah was on the way one day to feed his sheep and he found his daughter-in-law disguising herself as a harlot. And he went in unto her, not knowing it was his daughter-in-law. And she conceived and she bare a son and the name him Phares. Well, God said an illegitimate child would not sit on the throne of Israel or not enter into the house of God, brother, until the tenth generation. That's Old Testament scriptures. In the New Testament, it's different. In the New Testament, whosoever believes can be saved. 
But in the Old Testament, an illegitimate child could not come into the congregation of God for ten generations. And so now Pharaoh is an illegitimate son of Judah, yet he's Judah's son. Then we find then that God jumps over these generations. If you will come to the book of Ruth and read the last chapter, you'll find what happened there. Now Israel began to cry out for a king. They said, we want a king. We want a king. Now God could have anointed Jesse to be the king of Israel, but he was the ninth generation. That is too early. It must be in the next generation because of Pharaoh's being an illegitimate child. So God turned aside and went to the tribe of Benjamin. Out of the tribe of Benjamin, God had them to anoint Saul to be king. But when Saul died, the tenth generation came along, and then God anointed David. God jumped over to ten generations and anointed David then, and through his line would come the Messiah, a man to rule on the throne. Then we see that God said, O King Ahaz, a wicked king, he said, Ask me for a sign. King Ahaz said, I don't want a sign, I don't need a sign. God said, all right, I'm going to give a sign to Israel. The Jews require a sign. 1 Corinthians 1, 22. God said, I'm going to give a sign to Israel. In Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, some 700 years before Jesus was born on this earth, God said, this is the sign I want you to watch. He said, A virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and ye shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Now they must watch for a virgin to bring forth a son. That was a sign God gave for 700 years before Jesus came. They watched, the people of Israel watched for a virgin to conceive and bring forth a son. Time rolled on. Then we find that sure enough, when time came, in fullness of time, there came one born of a woman, the seed of the woman, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. We find that Mary conceived by the Holy Ghost and gave birth to Jesus Christ exactly like Isaiah said in Isaiah 7, 14, some 700 years earlier. But wait a minute now. After the birth of Jesus Christ, we find that four other boys were born into the home of Joseph and Mary after the birth of Jesus. Now the Bible said the person that sat on the throne of Israel must come through the line of David. So we start down the line of David through Solomon. God said the child must come through Solomon to sit on the throne. That is, uh, they must be in the lineage of Solomon. And we move down that line and we find a wicked king by the name of Coniah or Jeconiah. And God said to Jeconiah, I'm putting a curse upon you that no son of your descendants will ever rule on the throne of David forever. Now Joseph came from the descendants of Solomon and through Jeconiah. And there he was with five sons, four of his own. And then of course Jesus, which was recognized uh, under the law in the land of Israel to be his son. Although Jesus Christ was the very son of God. And so there was Joseph now with five sons. But four of those sons could not reign on the throne of Israel because of Jeconiah, the curse that came on him. So that ruled out four of those sons. That only left one, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. And by law, he could fit that because he was adopted son of Joseph into his family by law. But wait a minute. God did not stop there. God began to move through Nathan, there a son of David, and through Nathan, through his lineage, came Mary. She was born a descendant of David through Nathan. And therefore Jesus Christ could rule on the throne of Israel and rule on the throne of his father David because he was a descendant of David, not only through Solomon, but also through Mary, through Nathan, and through Mary as well. And so Jesus Christ was the perfect one in this family. The other four boys ruled out that could fully reign scripturally on the throne of his father David. 
So Jesus Christ then was virgin born exactly like Isaiah said he would be born. Now this is the most unusual birth ever recorded in the history of mankind. Now there's four ways in which God can build a human body. God can build a human body and did build one without the agency of God, or rather without the agency of man or woman, and God himself built that body, and that body was Adam's body. God built a body without the agency of man or woman. And then God built a body by the agency of the man. He took from Adam a rib, and from his side God built the body of Eve. And then God builds bodies by the agency of man and woman. And that's the way we came into the world. There's only one other way in which God could produce a body. And that would be through a woman only. And that's exactly what God did whenever Mary conceived by the Holy Ghost. Uh, she gave birth to the seed of the woman. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, the Bible said, The seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. Jesus Christ was the seed of the woman and that was the fourth way that God could produce a body and that's the way the body of Jesus Christ came about. It was the most unusual birth ever taken place on this earth. You cannot go to heaven denying the virgin birth of the Son of God. Never. When you deny the virgin birth of the Son of God, you deny the deity of Jesus Christ and you have no Savior. If He is not God, if He is not deity, then you don't have a Savior. And so we find then that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin and He was the only begotten Son of God. The only one. Now this, this birth is most unusual in many ways. It was unusual because it predicted by the prophets as to how and where it would be born. The prophets of old, for instance, Isaiah and Micah, tells us exactly where that boy would be born and how he would be born. In Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, the Bible said a virgin would give birth to a child. Didn't say another woman. The modernists and the infidels in these rotten translations today have changed that verse of scripture to a woman. But that's a tact of the devil against the word of God. If you have a Bible in Isaiah 7 14 it reads there that a woman shall give birth to a son. Throw that thing in the garbage can and get you a Bible. You don't have a real true Bible. The infidels and the modernists today have translated these rotten modern translations and they have changed that verse of scripture and many other verses in the Bible that has to do with the deity of Jesus Christ. Don't keep a Bible in your home where it doesn't say a virgin in Isaiah 7, 14. Throw it in the trash pile. Get rid of it. It's no good. Get you a real true Bible, the word of God. Then in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, the prophet Micah tells us exactly where this child would be born. It says, But thou Bethlehem Ephratar, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruling Israel, who is going forth and been from old, from everlasting. Now the old prophet, many, many years before Jesus was ever born, said when that virgin conceives and time comes for her to give birth to a child, she'll give birth to that child in Bethlehem of Judea. You know the story in the book of Luke, how they went to be taxed. And while they, while Mary and Joseph were in Bethlehem, and they lived in Nazareth, some 65 miles away, and while they were in Bethlehem, she gave birth to Jesus. Now why? Because that's exactly where God said he would be born. And God cannot lie. And the Bible says, a virgin shall conceive... And a virgin shall give birth to a son, and that birth will take place in Bethlehem, Judea. And the Son of God was born there like the Bible said, and he was born in a cow stall. Secondly, it was unusual because it changed the course of history. In uh, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made him a woman, made under the law. Now the birth of Jesus Christ changed the course of history. 
You may say, preacher, what do you mean? When you look at your calendar, you'll know what I mean. When you see B.C. and A.D., B.C. means, of course, as you know, before Christ, A.D. after Christ, and the whole world changed its calendar and centers around the birth of Jesus Christ. I don't know the birth of any other man that changed the course of history like the birth of Jesus Christ has never been. These false prophets like Muhammad and Buddha and all that gang, they didn't change the course of history in this respect. But the birth of Jesus did. And in number three, it was unusual because it was proclaimed by angels. How many births do you have record of where the angels came and declared exactly how Jesus would be born and the conception would take place and give in detail all about this birth. Why else do you find that? You don't find it. That's why his birth is most unusual. Read Luke chapter 1 verses 26 to 31 and you see what I mean. Read Matthew chapter 1 verses 20 and 21. I don't have time to read this, but you read this, you see what I mean. Read Luke chapter 2 verses 10 to 11, you'll see what I mean. These angels came and there they gave information pertaining to this birth. Because this birth is the most unusual birth that ever took place on the face of the earth. Luke chapter 1 verses 26 to 31, if you care to jot it down. Matthew chapter 1 verses 20 through 21. Luke chapter 2 verses 10 through 11. And see how the angels played a part in the birth of the Son of God. The most unusual birth ever taken place on the earth. Number four. It was unusual in that it stirred the shepherds in the field. If you read Luke chapter 2 and verse 8, verses 15 through 16 and verse 17, you will find that this verse uh, stirred up those shepherds out in the field watching over the sheep by night. You don't have any record where any other birth stirred up shepherds in this manner. If you read the scripture, you'll find here that they were greatly stirred up over this birth. God did something. And God gave them some information. And there's a great stir among these shepherds. They wanted to go and see what had happened in Bethlehem. Now the shepherd's field is not very far from Bethlehem. It's a very beautiful field. I've seen it many times. I hope to see it again in March of next year. A very beautiful field not far from Bethlehem. Bethlehem is one of the most beautiful little towns in Judea. Very beautiful. And so these shepherds came to this uh, stable, this cave, there to see what had happened. Number five, it was most unusual in that it was required into by wise men. Now they had the intelligent men in those days like we have today, the GBI, the uh, CBI, whatever, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, anyway, we have what we call our intelligence department in Washington today that get all the inside news of things that's taking place, keep the president informed and so forth. They had wise men in those days. And this bird stirred the wise men. Not only did it stir up the shepherds in the field, the humble men, that watched over their sheep, but this verse stirred up the wise men of that day. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Probably from Saudi Arabia. They came here from, to Jerusalem saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. So we find the wise men being stirred up over this birth. I don't know any other birth of this type that stirred wise men in this sense. Then we find number six. It was unusual in that it greatly stirred up the wrath of Satan. I mean the devil really got stirred up over this birth. The devil hoped that Mary would miscarry or damage that child evidently when they had to travel all the way from Nazareth, 65 miles on foot and donkey, when she was heavy with child before that child would be born in Bethlehem. The devil hoped that damage would be done there, but there was no damage done. And then the devil moved upon the innkeeper so that they couldn't have a decent place for Jesus to be born and they had to go to a cow stable. The devil laughed about that. And then the devil moved up on old King Herod and said, Now 
there's been a king born, and you know what he'll do? He'll rise up and take over your throne, and you better do something about it. And the devil said to King Harry, if I were you, I'd have every child killed two years old and under. And Herod orders forth the command to have every male child killed two years old and under. But God beat him with the draw and said to Mary and Joseph, get out into Egypt and leave immediately. And they left. And Herod had all the little innocent boys killed two years old and under, took them out of their mother's arms, put them to death, hoping that he would kill Jesus. But Mary and Joseph were then on the way to Egypt. After old Herod died, then they came back and went back to Nazareth. See, the devil's always been a fool, giving up rope to hang himself. And the devil was greatly stirred up at the birth of Jesus Christ. Number seven, it was unusual in that it brought God to man. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The birth of Jesus Christ brought God from heaven down to man. The Bible says God is a spirit. The Bible says spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. And if God is a spirit and doesn't have flesh and bones, then God had to have flesh and bones to come down to the earth. And that's exactly what he took on. He came down here and took upon himself flesh and bones that he might live among us. And he became a human, although very God, and God came down to man. In John 1 and verse 14, the Bible said the Word was made flesh and dwell among us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 and 21, the Bible said to wit that God was in Christ, reconciled the world unto himself, for he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So we have God coming down to man. When Jesus Christ was born the virgin Mary, that was God in that little body. And he took on that little body that he might live among men and die. Had he not taken on that body, he could not have died. But he took on that body that he might leave that body, and that's what death's all about. When someone dies, they leave the body. That's what he did. He took on a body that he might leave it on the cross, and he later came back and went back in that body in the tomb. And Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, came and took on human form. Truly the birth of Jesus Christ was the most unusual birth that ever took place on this earth. And as we come to this season, the Christmas season, God's people need to be fully aware that what we celebrate at this particular time of the year is the fact that Jesus was born, that God did come to man, that God took upon himself flesh and God died on the cross, was buried, and rose again, and is coming again. So we celebrate the fact that he was born. You may say now, Preacher Edwards, we don't know the exact day. Well, maybe not. Maybe he wasn't born on December the 25th. What does that matter? What we're concerned about is that he was born. And he came into this earth about 2,000 years ago. And the most unusual birth ever recorded in the history of mankind was the birth of Jesus Christ. Never been anybody else virgin born. The wife of Nimrod the mighty hunter claimed she gave birth to a child without a human father. She's a liar of the devil. That was a trick of the devil trying to corrupt the virgin birth of Jesus Christ and mar that. And so anybody that claims to give birth to a child without a human father is a liar. There's never been but one virgin born a person on the earth, and that was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and never will be. Let nobody kid you. And so it's the most unusual birth that ever lived. I want to give you this Christmas story in closing. Some of you heard me give it before, and, and I think it's so fitting. There was a preacher one time visited a prison. As he sat on the platform by the warden, the warden said, Do you see number 37 out there? He said, Yes. So I want to tell you something about him. He said here some time ago, one Christmas morning, he said it was real cold and early Christmas day. I left this cold prison to go home. And as I went on the outside of the prison, there standing beside the prison wall was a little girl. She was trembling, her lips and hands blue with cold. She had a little something in her hand wrapped up in a little white piece of paper and a little ribbon around it. I said to her, I said, what are you doing here, little girl? 
As she began to weep, she said, Sir, my dad is in that prison, and it's Christmas, and I want to bring him a little Christmas present. I want to see him. Mother passed away some time ago, and little brother passed away, and I want to see my daddy. And he said, what's his name, little girl? And she told him the name, and he recognized the face immediately. A man in there for a lot of crime, very wicked man, committed many crimes, a long prison term. He said, all right, hon, come with me, and I'll let you go in and see your daddy. He carried her on the inside of that prison wall and set her down, and he called for her dad. When her daddy started, uh, when her daddy came toward the little girl, she rose up to meet him and said, Daddy, and there's a scowl came over his face, and he frowned, and he said, uh, um, What are you doing here? She said, Daddy, I, I wanted to come see you on Christmas Day. And why? Well, he said, You've got no business here. He said, What are you doing here in the first place? He said, You shouldn't have come here. And the warden said, uh, she wants to talk with you a little bit, uh, sir. Would you talk with her? And the man sat down and an awful mean look on his face. And he said, yes, I'll talk with her. And so the warden kind of slipped away a few paces. And he sat down with the little girl. And, and she said, Daddy, I brought you a little something. said, uh, I know how you love little Johnny, my little brother, your son. And, and said, uh, little Johnny died some time ago. And the man said, you mean to tell me my son is dead? She said, yes, daddy, little Johnny died in the poor house. And Mama's dead also. And, oh, he said, you, you can't tell me my little son is dead. She said, yes, daddy, he's dead. And said, daddy, I brought you a little Christmas present, not much. And there she unwrapped a little napkin, took the little ribbon from around and unwrapped it. In that napkin was a little golden curl that she'd cut from the head of little Johnny, her brother, and wrapped it up neatly to bring it to his daddy. She said, Daddy, this is a little curl from little Johnny's head. I, I know that you appreciate it. And the old man began to weep. He said, Nettie, you shouldn't have done this. You, sh you shouldn't have done this. Oh, my son, he's gone. She said, Daddy, I'm living in the poor house now, and this is all I could bring you on this Christmas day. And the old man got out on his knees and his body shook with sobs. And he took that little girl in his arms and said, Honey, you shouldn't have done this. He said, Daddy, it's Christmas Day. I wanted to bring you this. Johnny's gone and Mama's gone. And you're all I have left, Daddy. But he said, Daddy, I'm going to tell you I love you. And I'm going to stand by you. And said, One of these days, Daddy, I'm going to see that you get out of this awful place. And there the man, weeping after they spent about 30 minutes together, took the little girl in his arms and kissed her. And then she started out and waved back at him and said, Daddy, I love you. I'm going to stand by you, Daddy. I'm going back to the poorhouse. I'm going to help you out of here one of these days. This warden said to that preacher, said, You know, that changed that man. That man was converted and became one of the greatest, finest gentlemen in this prison. Several years later, the same preacher went back and the warden said, would you like to see that little girl and his father? said, I sure would. They went to a beautiful little home down the street, knocked on the door. Beautiful young lady came to the door, an old gentleman, hair white as snow, came to the door. He said, here they are. They finally released him in prison, and he came back to live with his daughter, and they're happy. And it's wonderful what God could do in a situation like that. A little Christmas gift, a little curly Curl, a little curl of hair from his little son broke his heart. The birth of Jesus Christ is the greatest birth ever performed. Let us stand our feet, would you please? Our Father, in the name of Jesus, our precious Lord, I come today, I pray that you'll take the message and that you'll use it to thy glory and may thy name be honored. Thank you, Lord, that Jesus was born Thank you, Lord, he's our Savior and our Lord. Thank you, God, for the birth of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that we have been born again by the Spirit of God. Have your way in this invitation in Christ's name. Amen. They're going to play about two stanzas, one or two. If you're in this building and you're unsaved, backslidden, or you want to join the church, you want to, you want to come forward for any reason, you may do so while we wait just a moment while they play. Would you come?
you need to get saved, come back to God and join the church. You may come. Waiting just a moment. How about it?